So thank you everybody for joining us today. Really appreciate you making the time to come on to the first of our reset show calls, shows. I don't know what, what can we refer to this. Um, before we get stuck into what on earth this is all about, I thought it'd just be good to do a couple of intros. So for those of you that don't know me, my name's Emma Bridger. I'm founder and MD of People Lab. Um, we are specialists in uh, employee experience and engagement. So we help companies create brilliant, wonderful, compelling experiences that result in engagement. And that's all I'm going to say about us and People Lab because today is not about a big sales pitch. Um, I'm joined by my wonderful co-hosts, uh, Belinda Ganaway and Justin McCarran. So B, do you want to introduce yourself for those that don't know you? Thank you so much. And thank you for sharing those um, the business names. That's great fun. So I'm Belinda. I know some of you. Um, if those of you who I don't, hello, it's nice to meet you. Um, I am a design thinking facilitator and team coach. So I'm part of a employee experience agency called Fathom XP and we partner a lot with People Lab to, and Emma and I have taken it to the next extreme by writing a book together on employment experience design which is coming out next March. Thanks B and then Justin many of you might know Justin because he was involved in our well-being lunches so hi Justin. Hello um, hello again to those of you who I've met before and like uh, Belinda said Hello to those of you I haven't met before. I'm Justin and I run a business called Everyday Resilience. Uh, the clue is in the title. I'm a resilience coach and I work with individuals and organisations. And uh, it's in that capacity that I'm joining the call with uh, Emma and B and Katie today. Cool. Thanks, Justin. No, no puns there, Justin. No, <laughs> yeah. no, it's a pun-free zone uh, currently. Um, <laughs> although I might have to rethink that really because resilience is a bit of a boring, dry topic, isn't it? I might have to jazz it up a little bit and make it a bit more, uh, a bit, bit more light touch. Cool. Um, I've got Katie as well, who's kind of helping to the technical side of things, a colleague at People Labs. So hi, Katie. Hello. Um, any questions, any thoughts, any comments, please use the chat. I think we're all kind of Zoom experts now, aren't we, pretty much after the kind of like however many months of lockdown it's been. But um, if you haven't used Zoom before and you want to ask a question or make a comment, then use the chat facility, which is I need to look at the screens. Remember, on my screen anyway, it's kind of in the bar at the bottom in the middle. There's a little speech bubble. Just click on that and you can uh, you can ask us any questions. So let's get started then. The reset reset show. <laughs> I can't speak now. The reset show. So what is it all about and why did we decide to do this? So um, I think it's fair to say that the last however many months have, have been a pretty crazy time. I think <laughs> we'd all agree with that. And, and we've all been kind of, you know, feeling our way through it, navigating through this, this kind of crazy time. And there's been this gradual realisation that the world as we know it is, is well, the world is not ever going to go back to the way it was before COVID, essentially. So we're all kind of figuring out together what happens next? What do we do now? And um, for those of you that, that joined us um, for our wellbeing lunches back in March, we sort of said, well, how can we respond to this? How can we react to this? What, what, what can we do to help our network? And we set up a series of um, about eight weeks of wellbeing lunches, which was a very kind of a, an instant reaction to people need some help with wellbeing. We've got lots of expertise. Let's just crack on and share some resources, etc. We had some great feedback. And we did that for eight weeks and uh, Justin helped me facilitate those. So thank you, Justin. And they went really well. We got great feedback. Um, but we started to kind of um, just pause and reflect at the end of the eight weeks and say, well, what, what next? Where does this go now? And I guess that this, the research show is really that kind of a broadening, I guess, in terms of, you know, we're, we're kind of moving out of the react phase, if you like, into um, the kind of adapt and renew phase or reset, as we're calling it. And it's just brilliant opportunity to really... Um, talk, share, collaborate um, in terms of where we go now and what happens next. And whilst there's no doubt that there's been, you know, many uh, awful negative impacts of COVID and we, I'm sure we've all been affected by it in some way. Um, the flip side to that is it's been this great opportunity to really um, do things differently and, um, you know, Trojan horse and some of the stuff that we've been wanting to do, do for some time. So, this disruption, the chaos is going nowhere. And we thought, well, what, what do we do? How do we react to this? So we thought, actually, what we want to do is kind of um, broaden the theme, rebrand slightly, call it the reset show. And the, the show is very deliberate because what we want to do is have it as kind of a, almost like a kind of a mag magazine style format where we get different people on to talk, share, collaborate, um, get you interacting, get you feeding back on what you would like to see. Um, so really kind of have a one-stop shop, if you like, for... Um, tools, 
resources, creativity, thinking, um, interesting articles we've seen, want to share with you. Um, so really kind of just have a place to kind of gather all that stuff. Um, and perhaps maybe save you some time, because I don't know about you, but I'm kind of overwhelmed with the amount of information that's out there. So we're kind of doing that hard work, collating, curating, if you like, lots of different resources and kind of putting them in one place and sharing them via this channel. So that's kind of the, um, I guess that's kind of the, uh, the background. Anything I've missed um, being, being Justin in terms of what we're trying to do with this? That's no. good. That's why I'm here. So that's good. <laughs> Cool, that's great. Okay, so um, let's just, just we start with a poll. It's always good to start with a poll. We've got a poll set up. So Katie, could you run the poll if that's okay? <clears throat> got a little question for you. See where we're all at. So the question is, do you want to return to how you worked pre-lockdown? Let's see what people think about that. Get a few uh, a few responses coming through. Wow. Yeah, that's <laughs> pretty compelling, isn't it? Oh, a, few, a couple of yeses. Mm. The majority of people are saying no. Um, okay, I guess you can all see that. So we've got 90% uh, saying no and almost 10% saying yes. I'm gonna pick on someone, is someone brave enough? One of the yeses, brave enough to share why they said yes. Just really intrigued to find out what, what you know, where that came from. There's no right and wrong here, no judgment, by the way. Um, anyone want to share why they said yes? If you don't, that's fine. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna hunt you down. What Hi. about? Um, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, I'm happy to say why I said yes. Um, I'm Helen. Hi, Helen. Hi. Um, and I. I'm quite fortunate in that I only work part time anyway, so my view's a bit skewed, but I loved my commute to work. I worked in central London, I got the train in, um, but it was time all to myself and yeah. I had nobody calling on my time and it was my time to look out the window and think about things. Mm -hmm. um, I miss that separation and being away from my children. Um, and also just, I don't know, in the world of HR, I think I'm struggling to miss a lot of the smaller interactions that you get just when you pick up a little conversation in the kitchen, that kind of thing. So I know there are lots of other issues to consider, but personally, I, I preferred my work in life before. So. Yeah. Oh, thanks for sharing that, Helen. I can, I can personally really relate to that. I, I also am surprised at how much I miss the commute and catching up on music podcasts reading books doing work um and justin you and i've had the same sort of conversations haven't we about the commute before yeah we've been yeah. talking over the last uh, few calls about uh, the weekly lunches the weekly welding lunch about the research into exactly what you're talking about helen into uh, the potential downside of not having those uh, routines built into our day for us so having to create those uh, separately feels a bit odd but the advice has been you know if that was part of your routine where you would have every day half an hour where you'd sit and you'd you'd do the things that you've described uh, it's it's worth actually creating those so um, people were talking about you know um, going and finding a local cafe to sit in for half an hour where you do sit and you know, listen to your podcast or look out the window daydream because our our energy is you know we settle into these energy cycles and when we had this continuous routine of work it wasn't all necessarily bad so we tend to think oh commute bad but actually for lots of us the commute is a time where we as you said Helen we do get to switch off and uh, and go into what Patsy Rodenberg would talk about circle one energy which is very nourishing and restorative when mm -hmm. actually you just kind of shut down and you're in your own headspace and you're in your own world that's really really important for us and and that's difficult for us to find automatically if we're if our lives are if we're living in a busy house with with other people and kids and so um you're not alone in in missing that that aspect of your of your daily life and it's really important that we still find those pockets even when they're not automatically given to us yeah yeah it's a really really good point yeah um i know i i'm sort of finding that i'm sort of um almost not replicating the commute because that would be crazy but i'm 
I'm kind of faffing around for an hour before I actually start work in the morning. I've been able to find that I find it really hard just to go straight from I'm up, I'm dressed, I'm breakfasted into work. I have to kind of just ease myself into it. Yeah. I suppose, guess that's what, what we're talking about here. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, interesting. 90% sort of say no. And I think that, you know, it's, it's really interesting that there have been a number of positives that have, have come out of, of the whole, um, you know, the whole, whole COVID pandemic crisis we've been through. But I guess part of wanting to do this is there's no best practice or playbook out there for what we do. And I think this is really exciting because, I mean, I, I'm sure we've got lots of people on the call with different experiences, different routes into whatever it is that you're doing. But there's always kind of like the experts out there, aren't there? The, you know, the kind of gurus of, of, of what, whatever it is we're working with, whether L&D or HR or experience or engagement, whatever it might be, there's the gurus, the experts. And suddenly, I think it's this really exciting opportunity because whilst we've all got expertise that absolutely will help us to figure this out, there's no obvious place to go. There's no like, well, who do we turn to to help us with this? This is why I think this is a really exciting time because... There's no, I said, there's no best practice. There's no playbook. So what we really want to do is to use this time to, you know, to come together as professionals, practitioners, to kind of share, talk, collaborate, to build this for ourselves, to kind of build this collective, very, I guess, democratic kind of body of expertise. And that's what we're really trying to do here, which I think is really exciting. Um, and I think we're definitely seeing um, some positives um from you know from the last however many months as well as all the negatives let's kind of do the strength-based thing as you may know i'm a positive psychologist and i love the strength-based stuff um and i wanted to share with you some of the positives that we've seen at people lab and while i'm talking them through i'd love to hear your views on whether you've seen any positives what are they if you agree disagree so i've got a list here of a um a, a few kind of um notes that i've made of, of positives that we've seen personally people lab um, with clients and organizations that we're working with so i think um one of the first ones is empathy and i know b this is something that you're really passionate about we talk a lot about empathy and empathy is a big part of the work we do in the world of employee experience and i've seen a huge rise in empathy with the companies i'm working with and companies that are very I won't mention any names are very traditional um perhaps not that great at empathy but usually are suddenly being much more mindful of how their people are feeling you know what the impact on them is so um b have you got any thoughts on that in terms of the rise of empathy and they've written some great blogs on this already but um that's one of the benefits that i've certainly seen yeah i i think that's fascinating and it's got an awful lot of traction at the moment the conversation around empathy is 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 really alive um and i know that a lot of organizations are very rapidly starting to invest in training or upskilling or coaching particularly line managers around emotional intelligence which i guess empathy would broadly fit into. So I think that's a really, really positive sign because I think it's going to be, I agree, it's absolutely flowing. And, it, it's, and it, all the stats you see suggest that organizations have, on the whole, have been incredibly mindful about people's whole life experience. You know, they're not just trying to work, they're trying to work through a pandemic. And that's a very tricky thing. I do suspect it's going to be very hard. I mean, I know we're going to go through a major recession and there'll be a lot of financial considerations for organizations. At the same time, it's going to be very hard for organizations almost to suddenly close off that empathy tap, I think. So kind of what happens yeah. when we start to hit those financial realities and how that empathy piece plays out is, is going to be really interesting. Mm, definitely. That's a really, really good point. Yeah. Um, and by the way, I should have mentioned, we are going to be sharing a kind of a, I guess, a summary of um, the research show each week in terms of what we're talking about. And there'll be a heap of resources in there. We've got lots of different kind of resources that we will mention today that we're going to share in there. So, so it will kind of all be in one place for you afterwards. Um, I think the second thing we've seen, this is a really obvious one, is that companies are having to get used to using digital and you know we've seen um companies we work with who have been on kind of three-year programs to implement things like ms teams we've done it in three weeks and i think at last companies are getting much better at working digitally so that's a kind of a really obvious one i guess i won't, won't go into that too much um remote working and flexor working are becoming much more the norm so there's all sorts of research out there there's a huge amount but you know, depending on what you look at, you know, companies are sort of saying, actually, we don't think we'll ever go back to everybody being in the office in the way they were before. And, you know, some of the stuff that I just read this morning was sort of saying about 50% of the workforce, we think at the moment, who knows, will probably be 
uh, predominantly remote based as, as we get through this. So interesting sort of stats coming out on that. Um, I think one of the big things for me um, with the clients we're working with is it's kind of cutting through the bureaucracy to get things done. So decisions being made really quickly and um, rather than there being a kind of huge big program to, to you know, make big bureaucratic changes, people say, yeah, just, just do it. It's sort of JFDI kind of attitude. And I think that's been really positive. People, you know, the clients we work with sort of saying, we're just able to get things done. And suddenly just able to kind of, you know, cut through all that sort of, you know, all that permafrost of not being able to kind of get to the top and get things done. That's been a real positive. Um, employee voice, definitely on the up. I mean, um, you know, companies surveying people may be too much. Let's have a chat about that at some point. But, you know, lots more, you know, you know, catching up, touching base with employees and saying, how are you feeling? What's going on for you? Um, Leaders have had to become more focused on outcomes because, you know, the whole kind of, uh, you know, presenteeism issue, you know, people aren't in the same place predominantly, you know, in the main. So leaders have had to get much better at focusing on, you know, outcomes rather than, you know, the amount of hours you're at a desk. And we've done some really interesting work, again, with a very traditional client who before lockdown would have really struggled with this and we've got some great stories of, of managers who've been around for a long time who are saying I did not believe this could work and I've really had to kind of you know um, it's been really surprising for me I've had to kind of you know, look at this with a fresh pair of eyes and I can see now that actually it's not about I'm sitting at a desk it's about you know what, what they do um, and I think the last thing I'd say is that we're starting to see Finally, HR take a much more human-centered approach, which is brilliant. So that's, I guess, the sort of the last point I want to make. But anyone got any thoughts on on what they've seen in terms of the? We've got anything in the chat, Katie. What's come out of the sort of the positives? We've got a few things coming out there. Yeah, absolutely. So from Victoria, we've said uh, what I've seen is that there is a great focus on empathy for those employees on furlough. However, those employees who remain actively working seem to be a bit missed from that focus. Interesting. Interesting one. Um, also from Eileen, uh, McKinsey had a great article today reckoning uh, we have ch changed, have made the changes equivalent to 10 years in 90 days. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a great one. Eileen, we'll, we'll share that. I think I, I think I might have seen that as well. McKinsey stuff, by the way, um, if you're not signed up to McKinsey, I would highly recommend because they have so much great stuff that's coming out, you know. Um, some of it's not that relevant. A lot of it is. So sign up to McKinsey if you haven't done already. It's all free. The stuff I'm taking out. So that's that's really good. Um, no, there's another couple, of, another couple of comments here. Yeah. Sorry, I mean you already caught it. <laughs> oh, hi Fiona. Nice to see you on here. Finance becoming more human. Yeah, brilliant. Love that. <laughs> Who's because I missed that? Um, finance. Yeah. Fiona yeah, was saying finance are becoming more human, which is awesome. Okay, and then a lovely comment from Liz as well, just building on Eileen's comment. So thank, thank you for that. Again, this is great because what we'll do is we'll put this all in one place and share it with you. So you've got all this at your fingertips. Okay, so there's something um, we wanted to, what we're going to do each week is um, kind of take a theme, kind of a, you know, a relevant, you know, um, in the news, in the blogs, something that's kind of happening at the moment, theme that we think will be useful, interesting to talk about. And as we go through these, we're going to be doing these every other week, by the way. If there's anything specific you want to, um, you know, you want to see, hear about, us to pick up on, then please let us know. But this is the first one. So the, what I wanted to do was to um, just kick off a conversation, really, um, around some, some really interesting blogs and, and studies that I've been reading over the last few weeks. And again... McKinsey, well worth signing up to. Um, Josh Bassin, I'm sure you've all heard of him. If you haven't signed up to his stuff, it is awesome. Um, some of his stuff you have to pay for. It's not a huge amount. Some of it you don't, but we'll share the free stuff that we can share. Um, but he wrote a really interesting article on LinkedIn probably about a month ago now, which I responded to. And um, he talked about um, Gallup and Quantum Workplace. Again, we'll share all of this. Uh, are reporting that engagement is through the roof. So we've never seen higher engagement. I think it's, it's, it's the high, highest it's been in 10 years, I think. And Gallup is sort of saying the, 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 the gap between the, the engaged and the disengaged has never been greater. So there's fewer people that are disengaged and more people that are engaged. And uh, quantum workplaces have reported similar. 
on the flip side, I have seen some other research that's saying it's through, it's gone the other way. So Harris said the other way, but let's just take the, the good news story here. And um, what Josh talked about um, was what, why, why are we seeing this? And um, his, I guess his reaction was, well, initially was, well, because people are really, you know, thankful to have a job. And, and I, I, that didn't really resonate with me. I thought, mm, I'm not sure that's the case. And I think for me, and I'd love to hear what you think, there's um, something else at work here. Um, so I think there's a definitely something around the kind of autonomy piece. People are being trusted. They're being able to work in a way that's, you know, um, you know, suits them better, perhaps. Um, I also think as well um, that, you know, we what we see is that sometimes in the most difficult of circumstances, we have our kind of best experiences. The kind of pain is good um uh, analogy um we we collect as you know well some of you may know we collect a lot of best experience stories where we ask people to share um stories about times when they were you know really having a great time at work or really engaged at work and nine times out of ten people talk about you know it was challenge it was tough um there was a problem to solve and i think it's almost that kind of wartime spirit of like the best of times and the worst of times i think that's playing a role as well um, but the, I guess where we wanted to go today with this was um, the role of purpose. So um, purpose in a pandemic, if you like. And um, we all know, I think most of us know, that um, purpose has a huge role to play when it comes to, um, you know, how we feel about work. It has a massive role in engagement. So we wanted just to explore that a little bit, say, well, what's the role of purpose in a pandemic? And again, we've got some resources to share with you. Uh, and how does this play out? And I'm just going to kick this off by just talking very briefly about, I guess, the role of brands with external purpose before we bring it inside. So again, I'll share some, um, I'll share some slides with you afterwards, but I found some really great um, stories of companies who are doing fascinating, uh, very purpose-driven stuff that's really helping their, I guess, their consumer brands. I've got a list here, I'm going to read from the list here. So, um, Brewdog, um, you may have heard of this. They started to, they, they, they obviously make booze. Um, they use their facilities to make hand sanitizer. So great purpose there. Um, Uber Eats waived delivery fees on independent businesses. Um, LinkedIn provided a load of courses for free to people. Um, National Trust opened up parks for free. And there are lots more examples. So some companies really got on board with this whole kind of external purpose piece. Um, what I'd like to do is to kind of think about that from an internal perspective and really ask B and Justin to kind of explore the role of purpose in a pandemic. Um, so B, thoughts on that in terms of how purpose plays out and how purpose can really help us in this kind of this, this time of crisis? Yeah, such a good question. And, and some of the stuff that's already come up sort of really plays into this. So if, if anybody's read um, a book by a guy called Dan Coyle called The Cult Culture Code, if you haven't, I recommend it. We'll put it in the, in the links afterwards. But he talks a lot about the, the, the importance of purpose in creating really great organizational cultures. And what he says in that is that culture, I'm sorry, purpose is really crystallized during a crisis. So I think that's really interesting as a, as a thought. How does it emerge? How does it serve you? Um, and what is the role of purpose during a crisis? So there's some, it's purpose has kind of been on organizations agendas a lot more for the last two or three years. Um, what Deloitte in their human capital trends report say is that this, there's a maturing of this conversation around purpose. So it started off about being crafting and reinforcing vision, vision and mission and purpose statements, that sort of thing. But now it's been much more, it's been about engaging the workforce, what it says con continuously, can't speak, continuously reimagining work to tie purpose to meaning. And so that's for employees, but also for the organization and also societal. So there's this kind of like big P, like organizational purpose and how it impacts the world around it. But there's also the little P, organizational purpose and how it impacts the people within the organization and how they relate both to the organization and, and to each other. So still with Deloitte, it, it, it it surveys 9,000 um, business leaders and HR leaders every year for part of this report. And what its latest research says is that those people, those people have put feeling aligned to purpose and mission and values as the number one driver of belonging. 
And I'm going to say that again because it's a little bit convoluted. So when you ask people who are running, or these 9,000 people who are running organisations or running HR teams, what is the number one driver of belonging for the people in your organisation? Number one is feeling aligned to, to purpose. So that's really, really, really significant. And I think this idea of belonging is really under, under stress um, in the current environment. I know not everybody is working remotely and it's easy to assume that like us, we, everybody is. And there's lots of people out there doing amazing jobs, um, not at home. But for those of us at home, that sudden and overnight disconnect from our colleagues and from the organization is is a big issue and it's re, re, there's a real risk of it will deteriorate trust cohesion and this sense of belonging so for me that's a very long-winded saying way of saying for me that's where purpose fits in it's a way of reconnecting people around a central goal about why we're here why we exist and re, so reconnecting people to the organization and also to each other as well to create that sense of belonging mm -hmm. so there's more i can go into i've got a few tips on how you might do it but i'd love to hear how that's landing with other people and where you know the people on the call where you're seeing purpose show up or not show up in your organization at the moment mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really interesting. And again, we'll, we'll share the, the resources we've talked about here with you. Um, and it's really interesting with purpose because we talk about the rise of the purpose motive and Dan Pink kind of popularised that many years ago. And everyone has got this, you know, the world and his wife's got a kind of a purpose now. And I, I'm really interested what, what you guys think about this, because I think there are some organisations that have that kind of that, you know, really, you know, uh, worthwhile purpose. If you work for a charity, for example, the NHS, you know, you've got bags of purpose. But I always think about the time when I was a student, I was relate, I was going back to this job and I was trimming lettuces um, and there wasn't a purpose there. I worked for a farm and if someone had tried to tell me that the purpose was, you know, to put salads on the nation's table, I would have, I would have been a bit insulted by that. So I'm just trimming lettuces, mate, you know what I mean? Justin, have you got any thoughts on that at a kind of a, you know, a, a kind of a more of a, an individual level, I guess, around values and, and, and how per, the kind of big picture purpose and the, you know, that relates to your values at work or any thoughts on, on anything we've talked about so far? Oh, you, you know me, Emma, well, well enough to know that I've got loads of thoughts. And the main thought that's going through my head right now is, mm, what's the one thing I'll pick out? to talk about. I'm, um, so I've got lots to say, but I'm interested in the question you asked um, Belinda just before, which was in, from an organizational perspective, uh, because I'm, in a moment I'm gonna talk about a more personal small P as you said, Emma, but mm -hmm. I'm interested uh, in hearing from, the, from everyone else on the call, uh, if that sparked any thoughts or reflections for, for you from an organizational perspective. I think your question was how, how has that shown up um, the notion of purpose, how has that played out or shown up for any of you? If anybody wants to unmute and join in, it'd be good to hear. Equally interesting, if it hasn't, if the organisation that you work with, if the purpose of the organisation hasn't shown up, I think that's also really interesting as well. Mm. And that was... I'm going to let people put stuff in chat and, and then we'll come to you once you put it in yeah. chat. So, um, I, think, sorry, I was just going to say, I, I like that differentiation between big P and little P. Hmm. I still think that's a really, that's a really useful way of thinking about this. Yeah, because I think we get confused as an individual, like you were referring to there, Emma, like with the, with the sort of popularization of this notion of we must have a purpose. Uh, it's, you know, this has become a thing, hasn't it? And if we're not living according to our life's purpose, we're sort of failing or we're missing out somehow. And we look at all these other people going, well, they've got their purpose sort of. What, what's the matter with me? I don't have my purpose. And we're kind of exposed to this notion that uh, if we work, if we do the right mental work, we'll discover what our purpose is. And once we've discovered our true purpose, everything falls into place. And I think that's a load of rubbish. Um, and, and I'm not the only one that thinks it's a load of rubbish. Um, uh, there are plenty of people who think it's rubbish. Well, I think purpose, uh, small p purpose, if you like, as defined as a, you know, what, what your individual purpose is very different to an organization's purpose. Uh, the, the trick though, is when your, your own sense of purpose is working in harmony with an organization's purpose. So when small p is working with big p, then you get this great, this great synergy, this great energy that is, and this is why I think um, B, the research you're talking about is saying when people, when we personally feel like what we're doing is part of a bigger deal, we belong to that, that, that feels good, that feels fulfilling, that gives us energy, that motivates us, that helps 
us show up and do our and do our best best work. Um, I'm just looking at what what has Joe said. Purpose has to be authentic and true to sustainable, not just a bandwagon jumped on to tick tick a box. Yeah. So I think that probably uh, Joe, uh, forgive me. I think that probably refers to um sort of brand purpose doesn't it um rather than individual purpose because to talk about individual purpose briefly emma because that's what you asked me to do yeah. um uh is so purpose for me is i like to think about purpose as energy um a purpose for me is this is the energy that we feel when we are acting or behaving in a way that is in harmony with what we feel is important it's as simple as that it's what what matters to us uh, and when we behave in a way that is in line or in harmony uh, with that that we get the energy from that mm. and by thinking that by saying things that are important uh, that's partly values but it's also partly activities and it's not something that we have decided it's not some, something that you can sit down and write a list and go right now that is my purpose it's innate it's probably always been part of you so to a large extent when we're acting and behaving in harmony with our purpose it's doing those things that we just do automatically that come naturally to us that we have a uh, an innate gift or propensity or desire or we're drawn to and the thing is sometimes we underestimate that and we undervalue those things because they come naturally and actually that's uh, uh, that's a shame that's a mistake because those are if you like that is our natural gift uh, that is part of the reason, however philosophical you want to get, is part of the reason we're here is to do, it's that sweet spot between doing what we're good at and, and uh, what we enjoy. And they're not the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, and quite often we discover something we're good at when we're young and we end up doing that. And actually you don't have to do that. Just because you're good at something doesn't mean you have to do it. But on the same hand, you might enjoy doing something but be hopeless at it. So you're going to have to balance those things, those two things out. But that's all I wanted to say about purpose just on this call is to really simplify it and to think about it. Of, it's that energy that happens when those things are in harmony. So in essence, when we're behaving in a way that is in harmony with what we feel is important and what matters to us. OK, no, that's really interesting. Got a couple of great comments coming through. Um, Victoria, yeah, I, love, I love your comment. Um, she says that, you know, we often feel as if we're failing, if we don't have a purpose. And I think, yeah, I, I, I definitely can relate to that for sure. Um, and interesting, Fiona was saying that, that her company's purpose has not shown up during this time. So I think that it's quite a relevant comment that because I think, you know, the world of purpose has been, you know, talked about, researched, well documented for many years. I think what we're really interested in is how we can use this uh, knowledge, um, you know, experience of, of purpose in the current climate so i think you know uh, how does this show up now how do we use this this experience that we have how do we use this knowledge that we have to help us kind of plan for what comes next and i think you've got a great example i don't know if you, if you want to just unmute yourself and, and talk through that you don't have to if you don't want to but i'll put it out there if you want to no, um, more than happy to so yeah, no, i'm a hospitality and events business so completely closed during this time since 20th of march no revenue since 20th of march our purpose at the minute is to plan ahead. So you're absolutely right, Emma. My thoughts now are how do we get the team back in a safe manner? Um, are we going to be able to get them back when Boris has said that events may be able to happen in October? It's still a huge, huge question mark as to if and how they can happen. So yeah, trying to galvanize the team. I've got, I've got a call with them at two o'clock today, actually, just to say, guys, there's no change, but this is what we're doing and just trying to recreate a new purpose, I suppose, going forward is what I'm going to be doing. Yeah. That's a, that's a really interesting challenge and I'm not going to solve, we're not going to solve it now, but anyone got any thoughts on that? Let's, <laughs> but that's yeah. interesting, it's an interesting point. Cause I think it's almost that need to have kind of short term purpose, maybe whilst you're figuring out what comes next on the, the big kind of organizational purpose, that sort of what, what, what do we do for the next sort of week, few weeks, months, even. Um, what we've said is if and when we open up whenever that may be in you know this year we're going to wipe the slate clean and start the business afresh and then we're going seven years so actually if we knew what we know now would we still do it or would we change it um so we're kind of going along that guise at the minute 
but there's a lot of things still up in the air. There's, yeah. There are with lots of people. Absolutely. And I think that's a really um, completely get that, you know, it's hit, hit your business hard. And I obviously know you well and I, I know what you guys do. And yeah, I can't imagine what it must have been like. But I love that sort of sense of optimism that you just talked about there in terms of actually let's let's kind of reset and do it differently what what have we learned what can we do so there is that opportunity which is a kind of a almost like a once in a lifetime opportunity for a business really to go okay let's start again from fresh it's so. exciting but it's scary as hell <laughs> <laughs> okay that's interesting um b you've got any thoughts on on purpose in a crisis or in a pandemic yeah um we have i think I'm really fascinated. So again, as this McKinsey piece of work talking about the, the risk of the deterioration of trust, cohesion and belonging. So for me, there is something about a glue, the glue of purpose or a beacon, a goal maybe of purpose that I don't know why it's a stupid metaphor, but I keep coming back to the, the image of a maypole. So it's almost like purpose is in the middle and then it's connected through the ribbons and people dancing around it. So I told you it was rubbish, but I keep coming back to it. So I thought I'd share. So for me, Purposes, yes, it's in the, the good things that organizations are doing, whether that's, you know, you're a, a trainer's company, you're giving away shoes to frontline workers or whether you're create, you know, building incubators. That's kind of big P purpose. But then there's the purposes about how it's lived and breathed inside the organization during a crisis, how it's connecting people. And for me, I think it comes down to three things. So there's something about modeling it. So leaders, line managers, everybody in the organization, not just talking about it by but actually doing things that are demonstrably in line. So that's the little things as well as the big things like building incubators. And um, then there's something about um, repetition of it. And Dan Coyle was great on this. He talks about um, repeating it ad, ad, ad infinitum. So to the point where you just feel like you're gonna make people so sick that they're so bored of it. He said, but the point of repeating stories and conversations and signposts around purpose is really about that point about signposting. It's about navigation. It's about helping people navigate where this organization is going because it's going in the direction of the purpose, if that makes sense. So repetition, keep talking about it, keep, keep, keep talking about it until you're so bored. And that's the point, that's the point where people start to believe it and where people be able to, to navigate it. So model it and talk about it ad infinitum. And lastly, a really interesting thought, something about experimentation, about trying new things and actually as we've already said, this pandemic has been an opportunity to try a million and one new things. And some of those things are going to be really in line with your purpose and, and some aren't going to be so in line with your purpose. But this is an opportunity to try yeah. things, to bring purpose to life in lots of different ways. One last thought for me, and it's really um, something I thought Justin would enjoy. It's a quote from a book that I'm reading at the moment called The Adaptation Advantage. Really, really, really recommend it. Oh, where's it gone, Pooh? Hang on a second. She says, ah, Oh, okay, Pur purpose is not found, but discovered through the editing process of life, trial and experimentation. I really love that. And I'm definitely in the camp, which is, I don't have a purpose. My purpose is to make sure my children are fed and well. Um, you know, that, that makes that fundamentally feels like my purpose at the moment. But I love that thing. You don't need to have this grandiose purpose. Actually, it's about an editing process of life, trial and experimentation. I just love that. Oh, yeah, that's that's great. And I think um, we'll have a great case study from Fiona about kind of experimentation when, when, when we were through this. I've got a, 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 um, a, a great comment here from someone. Sorry, I don't know who the name's iPhone, but I'm sure that's not your name. Um, just launched a fresh purpose. So again, that would be great to hear more about that. And this is exactly why I wanted to bring you, you guys together. It's some really interesting stuff coming out here. So um, launched a fresh purpose around acting for human progress by protecting what matters. Um, running global conversations about the new purpose. So it's obviously some really cool stuff happening at AXA, which is, is awesome. It's exactly the sort of thing that we, you know, want to hear about and share and learn from. Um, so gathering, you know, insight from your people, which is, which is brilliant. So thank you for sharing that. Um, and we've got a few other bits and pieces coming through there. Yeah, the Airbnb, I mean, they're always kind of uh, leading the way with this, this kind of uh, stuff, aren't they? But some, some, um, some um, interesting comments there around um, uh, Brian Chesky, who's the CEO of Airbnb, linking um, what was happening with Airbnb back to their purpose. So um, I've got a quick poll I want to do just before we finish. But while we're doing that, um, I'd love to hear from you in terms of, you know, 
this whole area of purpose is there anything that you want to know more about or anything any questions that you've got or anything you want to see because what we can do is we can in, you know incorporate if we've got any of the answers i don't know but we incorporate some of that in the kind of the follow-up materials that we that we send out as well so um katie would you mind um launching the thank you the poll so wanted to ask you to what extent is is purpose informing your response at the moment to the crisis um no relevance at all or is it absolutely everything we're doing is behind that so kind of different answers coming out there which which you'd expect i guess but based on the conversation we've had so far um okay um that's really interesting so real sweep across the board there yeah i suppose that's to be expected really Guys, you got any, got any thoughts on that? Justin or B, got any thoughts on what we've seen come through there? Well, I think uh, we haven't, so the other people on the call can't see the results just yet. So mm -hmm. we're keeping them. Uh, oh, okay. We'll yeah. just give it another, cool. another couple cool. of seconds just to give everyone a chance to Okey dokes. answer. And like I say, while, whilst we're talking through this, please put anything you want to see here, questions, resources, anything that'd be useful to you. If you're, if you're kind of going through all this at the moment, actually, I'd love to hear more about that case study or that example, then just let us know. We can, you know, hook you up and swap and share ideas. Okay, so I think, I think that's... Uh, yeah, I mean, if you look at the sort of the top end of the scale between the threes, fours and fives, uh, by far the majority or even the, the fours and the fives is, I don't know, I, there's more heavily weighted in terms of organisations being purposeful at the moment that isn't. And I think that that's really interesting. It could be because um, people in our network are brilliant people like yourselves who tend to work for really purposeful organisations. So we could be slightly skewed, but that's, it's, I don't know, it's a really interesting result. Yeah interesting okay i'm mindful that we're pretty much at time so um as i said what we're going to do is we're going to share um, a bit of a write-up from today with all the different um kind of links to the different reports and research so it's all in one place for you so it makes it really easy so i'll share that with you um we're also going to share um every every couple of weeks either on on the call itself or afterwards kind of stuff that we've been reading that we think is really useful. Um, for example, Gartner have just released their kind of, you know, HR trends in response to COVID paper, which is really interesting. So I was going to share that with you. So basically a bit of a one-stop shop for interesting reading and useful resources at the moment. And we're also going to incorporate some kind of tools and activities as well. So with purpose, you know, we'll, we'll include some sort of some, you know, not top tips, but some advice and guidance if you need it. You probably don't, but if you need it in there as well. But please let us know if there's anything that you want to see covered, um, anything you want more on or less on, or any just any comments or feedback. Because the first one of these we've done, and we deliberately kept it kind of slide light or slide free. Does that work for you? Do you want more slides? You know, let us know. Um, what we're going to be talking about next time, we're going to carry on exploring this kind of paradox of high engagement but also high levels of burnout and stress and we're going to look into how do we respond to that because that's going to hit us in in you know all of us that work in in, in people facing roles that's going to hit us um if not already very very soon so what do we do with that where do we go with that and there's some really interesting stuff happening you know companies experimenting, for example, with, with shorter weeks, four day weeks, but lots of other stuff as well. So we're going to start to explore that a bit more. And obviously that kind of, you know, some of the well-being, um, you know, resources will, will come in there, but it's much, much wider conversation. So that's what we're going to be picking up next time in two weeks. Um, I don't know what the date is in two weeks. Katie, remind me. Is it the 12th of August? Off the top of my head, it's the 12th. <laughs> of August. Um, so yeah, any feedback, comments, we'd love to hear from you. Anything fine, finally from, from B and Justin, anything you want to kind of just say before we end the call? A uh, small P purpose for me uh, is just doing what you ever you are doing right here, right now, in this moment with full curiosity and commitment and attention. I love it. I would just say, yeah, let's not make purpose a stick to beat ourselves with. Um, it should definitely be something that we should hold our organizations to account for. And we are certainly part of those organizations as part of that community. So that's definitely something that we should be using as a steer 
but it's very easy to find things to hit yourself with at the moment and let's not make purpose one of those things. Brilliant. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it and really hope you can come along in two weeks. If you can't, we record them and we'll send them to you anyway. Um, and any thoughts, feedback, observations, anything, let us know. We'd love to hear from you. Other than that, um, have a wonderful day. And uh, as, as Justin said, curiosity and attention and whatever else, uh, wonderful words that you said, uh, Justin, that I can't remember now. But let's, let's do that. That sounds brilliant to me. So thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day and hope we see you in two weeks. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.